The brain of the PC is the central processing unit, or CPU. It is a complex microprocessor that consists of hundreds of thousands or even millions of transistors. The CPU is comprised of six main components, each performing a separate task. First, a unit called the prefetch queues up the next software instruction for the CPU. When the CPU finishes its current task, the prefetch unit asks for the next instruction. The second and third components are called the paging or segment units. They know the exact memory location of the next instruction and have it retrieved by asking the bus interface unit to send it from RAM. Say to add 2 plus 2, the bus interface unit passes the instruction along to the prefetch unit. The prefetch unit routes it to the decode unit, which translates it into a language the processor can understand. Finally, the instruction is transferred to the execution unit which carries out the software's commands. The result is then sent back through the paging or segment units, through the bus interface unit, and finally into its correct location in the PC's memory. We've been looking at an Intel 386 processor, a relative weakling these days. The more powerful Intel 486 processor is similar to the 386, except that it has two other components. One is a small 8 kilobyte memory cache. Its purpose is to squirrel away a little data or code so that it can be processed as soon as the CPU is ready. A 46DX processor also has a numeric processor unit built into it to speed things even faster. The newest Intel processor, the Pentium, has two memory caches, one for code and one for data. And it has two execution units so that two separate software instructions can be processed at the same time. These features go a long way to making the Pentium the fastest chip available for the PC. Your PC is built for a flexible future. Next to the microprocessor, you may find one or two empty chip sockets. If your microprocessor is a 386 or earlier model, one of these sockets is for the math coprocessor. As the name suggests, it's there to handle complicated arithmetic that would take your main processor a whole lot longer to do. On most 46 and Pentium machines, the math coprocessor is included in the main processor. In these cases, the extra socket is for a clock doubler, which can double the speed the processor handles most operations. The clock chip contains a precisely cut crystal that vibrates at a steady specific rate when electricity is sent through it. The vibrations are used to time all the events and operations in your PC. When you hear someone say they have a 25 megahertz or 33 megahertz system, they're talking about the clock chip. The higher the number of megahertz generated by the clock chip, the faster your PC will run. Before your PC can perform anything useful, data must be moved from storage on the floppy or hard drive into random access memory, or RAM. On most PCs, RAM is comprised of modular chipsets called SIMs, short for Single Inline Memory Modules. SIMs are designed to be easily removed or replaced in a PC. If you need more RAM, you can simply add more SIMs. Adding and replacing SIMs is a lot cheaper than throwing out the whole computer. Unlike floppy or hard disks, RAM stores information as tiny electric charges held in capacitors. This makes RAM very fast and flexible, but it also means RAM cannot store information without a constant flow of electricity. Once the PC's power is switched off, the electric charges in RAM disappear. Whatever information that was stored there is gone forever. That's why it's always a good idea to save your work to disk as often as possible. How does RAM store information? RAM is constructed of microscopic strands etched into the silicone of the memory chip. You can think of these electrical strands as pipes, like plumbing through which electricity flows. Some pipes represent addresses, while others carry data. Now let's say we want to store the letter A in RAM. First, the PC opens a section of memory by sending a burst of electricity across the address pipe. This electric burst closes a group of miniature switches known as transistors but only the ones needed for the data along that address line. Next, the actual information is sent as electric bursts across the address lines. Each burst is called a bit, 
and there are eight burrs traveling on eight lines, in this case to represent the letter A. In the computer's code, the letter A looks like this. Each burst travels through a closed switch and charges a capacitor. The turned on capacitors represent the ones. The uncharged capacitors are considered zeros. Because all capacitors lose their charge over time, bursts of electricity continuously flow to refresh them. How do all the different components of your computer communicate with each other? They use a special electronic pathway called a bus. Just like a passenger bus that can transport a large amount of people, the computer's bus can carry a great deal of information. The bus allows the computer standard peripherals, such as the keyboard and monitor, to talk to each other in other parts of the PC. The bus is made up of numerous electronic pathways called circuit lines, along which power and data travel. The original IBM PC's 8-bit bus has 62 lines, 8 of which transmit power to the adapter cards. Another 8 to 32 lines carry data to various components such as the memory chips or display. The next 20 lines are called address lines. They carry a coded roadmap to where the information is traveling. Each adapter card has a unique destination or address on the route of the bus. The remainder of the bus's lines carry commands for standard computer operations such as reading or writing data. Every component plugged into the bus is constantly looking for signals coming down the command lines. For example, when a signal to write data appears, only the input-output devices recognize the command. Other devices such as the memory circuits do not. Alerted by the write command, the I.O. devices check the address lines. If the code matches its address, an adapter accepts the data and follows the new command. Otherwise, the adapter simply ignores the instruction. There are many types of buses used in PCs today. How fast your PC performs depends on the type of bus it uses. The original IBM PC used an 8-bit bus to transmit data along parallel data lines, like these. The modern 16-bit bus, also called an ISA bus, transports data over 16 lines. To remain compatible, it can also accept older 8-bit adapter cards. The more advanced ESA bus doubles the number of lines again to 32. 8 and 16-bit cards fit into the ESA slots far enough to only contact the first row of 16 connectors. On the other hand, a true ESA board connects with all 32 contacts. The local bus overcomes a major problem with all the previous buses, namely slow speed. The original PC's bus ran at 8 MHz, but now modern processors can run at 66 MHz or more. To accommodate these high speeds, the local bus can carry 32 bits of data at a time at the speed of the clock chip. If your local downtown bus suddenly went 10 times faster, you'd definitely sit up and take notice. But for the modern PC bus, it's just another cruise down Main Street. The electricity that runs your PC must go through the power transformer. The transformer changes the 110 volt electrical current in your wall into the type of current your PC needs. Never attempt to open the transformer. It can deliver a nasty shock even if the PC is turned off, as our dear friend Zip has certainly discovered. All PCs come with an internal speaker. It's the one you hear when your PC makes an unattractive sound. The internal speaker doesn't have the dynamic range to be used with a multimedia system. But all that feeble beeping is still important. For example, the beeps you hear when you turn on your PC can alert you to a problem with your hardware. Most PCs have a video card that translates data from the software and operating system into the type of signals the monitor can use. The translation is performed with a DAC, or Digital to Analog Converter Chip. Some video cards also have special Windows Accelerator coprocessors. These speed up how fast Windows can display things by taking some of the load off your main processor. Some PCs have no video card. Instead, the video components are built right into the motherboard. A sound card is part of all multimedia systems. Sounds are recorded on computer disks as a series of numbers. 
The sound card's job is to translate those digits into the wavering analog signals that make beautiful music on your PC's external speakers. Two chips do the dirty work. One is called the DAC for digital to analog converter. The other is called a DSP for digital signal processing. It lets you change or improve the card's performance with software. The sound card also translates sounds from a microphone or audio input into digital form so it can be saved on your hard drive. A network card allows your PC to be connected to other PCs and to mainframe and many computers. The network card sends signals from your PC over a system of wires, over fiber optic cable, or over radio waves. On the other end are other users' PCs, PCs with large, fast hard drives called file servers, and print servers. File servers store the files that lots of people need to share. Print servers coordinate the sharing of, you guessed it, printers. A disk controller card is used to send signals to the floppy and hard drives. For floppy and older hard drives, the controller translates the instructions from your software into the signals that control the read-write heads. More advanced drives can perform that function themselves. These include SCSI drives, which stands for Small Computer System Interface, and IDE drives for Integrated Device Electronics. With these newer drives, instructions are translated on the drive. All the disk controller card does is make sure the instructions are routed to the correct drive. Several chips make up the PC's ROM BIOS, which stands for Read-Only Memory Basic Input-Output System. These chips contain permanent code that the PC uses when it's first turned on. The ROM BIOS also includes code that the operating system uses to talk to the keyboard, monitor, drives, and other system hardware. The battery sends power to the CMOS chip. That stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. It's a special type of chip that only needs a small charge to hold on to information. Then, when your PC is turned off, the CMOS remembers things like what type of equipment your system has, how much memory you have, and how big your hard drive is.